All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. This is the meeting of the week of uh, March the 16th, and we are very happy to have you joining us. Uh, I want you to know that we have our meetings here at SiliconValleyRotary.com every week, and you can come to the site anytime between Monday morning and Sunday night and join us for, for whatever we've got going that week. Uh, we want to tell about the things that our club is doing, about the cool things happening around the world uh, via the efforts of Rotary International, uh, and, and bring, you know, bring a little moment of inspiration and, and cool story to you as well. So this week, our speaker is uh, my friend John Lozano. John is uh, one of the charter members of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Uh, he has been a, a teacher, a school administrator, and is at the moment the, uh, the number one special education person at a very cool school called the Easterbrook Discovery School. And Hopefully we'll get to hear a little bit about that as we go as well. Uh, he's got plenty to tell you about a recent trip that he made to Guatemala, and with that, I am going to uh, pass pass the microphone over to John. So, John, you're on. Great, thank you, Rushton. I appreciate uh, seeing everybody here and the invitation to come speak at Rotary. Um, as Rushton said, I am uh, new to Rotary, so this is one of those things where I've known uh, Rushton probably. Uh, since about 95, 96, something like that. Uh, we met through some mutual friends, and uh, they said, you need to meet Rushton. And then when I met Rushton, Rushton said, I'm glad I met you. So um, that was the cool thing. And so uh, with that said, is, is Ro Rotary has been very good to me because it kind of fits within the values and the types of things I like to do now um, and what I do. And as Rushton said, is uh, I'm a school teacher. Um, I'm back in the classroom now. Years ago, I used to be um, a special ed teacher, 20-plus uh, years ago. L I went to get my master's degree, came back, and then got into school administration, which I felt was my calling to be a school principal if I really wanted to make change in education. I, I did that, um, worked at the high school level, went to the district office level, and then in 2008, um, after being at the district office for a number of years, I just wasn't happy doing that work at the time. So I left and traveled, in which something I love to do uh, now as I've gotten older is to travel and see cool places and neat things and have sense of adventure. Um, got back to the Bay Area here and, and connected again with Rushton and, and a few projects and then decided that I really wanted to be back in the classroom and somebody asked me well what makes you most happy and I said being with kids and more specifically with special education kids so um, that was really cool for me to do uh, uh, be back and work, working with lots of Lots of kids who have special needs, very different from when I first started in special education. Um, 20 years had passed since I had been in the classroom, so it was actually cool to be back in the classroom again. I say that because one of the cool things about being at the high school level is I got to travel with different musical groups and different uh, exchange programs to various places, Japan, Europe, uh, Hawaii, with, that was lots of fun. Um, but at the middle school level is more specifically where I'm working at, we really only go to Washington, D.C. and with all every other eighth grader in the United States and that if you've ever done that trip before it's good to do once probably not twice so um, uh, I thought Washington DC needs to be something different and then um, uh, a friend of mine uh, told me about some different programs that were out there that um, I could be involved in and I'll talk specifically about uh, one of them in the near future but why I'm saying that is because Really, I wanted to find a program where I can go off and do more service to, with my community, not just here in the Bay Area, but outside the Bay Area. I, I think back to, you know, as Shags had uh, talked about um, in our previous meetings about the history of his life, how Ro Rotary has affected his life and, and service to others has affected his life. I'm thinking back to, for me, where did this desire to do service come from? And um, reflecting on that, I, I was think back to my grandfather, my mother's father had come over from Mexico back in 1924 uh, with a fourth grade education and four kids in, in with him and they end up settling in the Central Valley out near Fresno, California. So for our Bakersfield crowd, um, they'll be excited to know our Bakersfield uh, Rotary members will like that. But my grandfather ended up uh, starting a farm, raising a family and uh, developed a work ethic that is at times, right, especially now, just really unmatched. He just raised a family. Um, my mother was born in Fresno area, and um, he really just, really just developed a sense of service within his community, helping others as he had this farm. My mom tells me stories about even when she was seven year, her seventh birthday, she spent 
um, bringing water to all the workers on the farm, and, and her father was just saying, it's because it's to help people become better people, and that's why you do it, and you're just out there serving the community. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and my mom brought that, that work ethic towards me. So uh, as I've, she raised me as a single parent, um, me and my three brothers, we all um, knew that we had to do good for our community. And so I'm saying that because it's kind of what took me into teaching is I really, um, after spending time in the, the, the dot-com world, I really wanted to be with kids. I really wanted to coach wrestling, which is kind of the thing that wrestling does, didn't introduce me as, but I coached wrestling for a number of years, um, really liked that sport, and then, again, serving others and working as a teacher. That kind of wraps up to getting back to why um, – I have been involved in my most recent, two recent projects that I've been involved with. And one of them, the first one I want to talk about is um, what I've been involved with in the last few years is what we call CISB. And that's, uh, you'll see the slide there, that's for um, Children's International Summer Village. It's an acronym for Children's Summer in International Summer Village. And um, it is a program that was started back in 1951 by a woman named Doris Allen in uh, the Midwest, out in Ohio. She was a school teacher, and, and she was trying to find a program, a summer program for kids that would help them be better citizens and so develop some global citizenship skills. You know, uh, it was one of those things where at 11 years old, they found that developmentally, kids still haven't developed their prejudices. They, have, they still have to develop their value system. And so she started this program for 11-year-olds back in Ohio. Subsequently, over the years, this program has gone from just locally in Ohio to internationally known. Um, they have chapters throughout the entire world um, where they have programs during the summer for kids from the ages of 11 all the way through the ages of 18 and some programs beyond. But it's really the programs are to help kids understand what being a better global citizen is all about. So again, it's a nonprofit, and I volunteer for it. I've been involved in a couple of uh, programs. As you can see here, um, last summer I was in Honduras, and I got to be a staff member at a camp for 11-year-olds in Honduras. As you see, it's a kind of a one, one schoolroom program. Uh, we had uh, kids from all over the world. We had 11 different countries there from Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Honduras, Portugal, Germany, the Faroe Islands, which I had not known any where the Faroe Islands was, Spain, Italy, and the Philippines. It was a great program. Um, and the thing that was cool about it is, again, CISB's mission statement is really to educate and inspire action for more than just a peaceful world. So they want people to really be take action and these kids to go out and serve their community. And that's one of the, what the leaders do. They also have an educational component to it. Um, they wanted others to appreciate similarities and differences between different people, support social justice and equality opportunities, um, develop some resolution and conflict uh, skills, develop leadership, and then they have these themes each year that they focus on one week conflict resolution, human rights, diversity, and um, I have the last one. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, and. As you can see in the picture here, these are 11-year-olds that are talking about um, things as what does world peace look like? How do you have a better global community? Um, this was, again, in Honduras. And along with that, we teach leadership skills and trust building, as you would be most camps that you have, um, to really work with each other. Again, the common language at these camps is English, but people come from various backgrounds. And our goal is that we teach them what it's like to be a global citizen. And after a month, of uh, being at this camp, you can imagine with the bonds that they make and 11-year-olds being able to work together to really talk about world issues. When you're talking about world peace, you might have somebody there from Germany or from uh, the Philippines, and what world peace and global citizenship looks like in those places is always different. Um, again, we really promote to have uh, be a peace ag advocate or activist even after the program. So you can imagine kids who are 11 years old grew up and continue to have this experience after four weeks and maybe hopefully take it on to the, the rest of their life. Um, as you can see, we have different countries there. This is a, a group from the Philippines. They display uh, some of their cultural activities. You kind of introduce uh, what your culture is like, different foods you have. Um, here's a group from Costa Rica who's doing a uh, dance for the community there to show them what 
uh, some culture is in, in Costa Rica. And there I am on the far left. Uh, that I was one of the staff members, and this is an international staff. We have a, a staff member from Portugal and from Honduras and from Guatemala. And the person in the middle there with the blue shirt is Fernando, who is joining us on this hangout here. And that's how I got to be involved with another program, but that's how I met Fernando, and that's part of the reason why he's joining us on this hangout today is he, like me, have this desire to serve others and to serve, make the community a better place. And, and we've made it a, a passion or a vocation of our lives to go out and serve others. We met um, mainly because there is a, a chapter of CISB here in San Francisco, and there's a chapter of CISB in Honduras. And back in 2011, Fernando came to the Bay Area as a leader with kids from Honduras, met the, step, the people here in San Francisco, and enjoyed himself. Subsequently, he went back down to Honduras, and he was starting a pro summer program over there, needed some financial help, and the San Francisco chapter agreed to help him. So that's why I get, got sent down there to help Fernando with this program. This picture here is from Ojojona, which is where our camp was at. So you can imagine we have probably about 48, 11-year-olds, and we're out uh, in the community doing different activities, seeing different things. There's our staff there from with our T-shirts, uh, and Fernando is there talking uh, about what we need to do to make this camp great. And we were there for four weeks in Honduras. I was there um, probably a little longer than that to help set up the program. But again, CISB, it's again, Children's International Summer Village. It's a great program. We have a chapter here in San Francisco, which I volunteer for. Two summers ago, I went to Brussels, uh, Belgium. Last summer I was in Honduras and then this summer I'm going to lead a group to Italy. So it's really a, a cool program to be involved with. You can see the excitement of the kids. This is all the kids at the camp um, doing different activities. It's not a sightseeing camp. It's more of an educational camp. We do go out and see the community but I always have to remind people it's not going out to see uh, sightseeing like you would in Washington DC. There's an educational component which I really love and I really like to be part of. Um, as you can see here, we developed a poster and we wanted to show everybody these are some of the values that we really want to do is help others and um, uh, just spread, spread peace to other people. So with that said, what it does is before I went to Honduras, I um, was looking around uh, and I found this video uh, on, online on Apple. It's called Living on One and it talked about four guys who uh, for college students who want to see what it's like to live on one dollar a day. Again, I was going down Honduras, knew nothing about Central America, or not as much as I probably should have, and found this video. And they said, oh, we filmed it in Guatemala. And these four gentlemen, and, and Russian had shared in a previous meeting the trailer for this movie, um, they wanted to live on a dollar a day. So they went out there, and for 56 days, they tried to live on a dollar a day. And it was difficult, to say the least. But what they found from that project is they were able to start, um, just, they just posted some stuff on YouTube. From that, they were able to make a movie. From that, they were able to start this website and this foundation about living on one dollar. If you check out the website when you see it, what I like about it, it has an educational component to it. As you can see on the right-hand side, you see they talk about issues like how does water affect your community? How does nutrition affect your community? Disaster, employment, finance, education. Because they faced all these things while they were college students trying to live on a dollar a day. And what they found is it's very difficult. The difference is they got to go back home after 56 days. The reality is there's people down there in, in Guatemala who are still living like that. With that said, I just knew I had to go down there. Ironically, Fernando and I were working together this summer. After our program was over, he needed a job. And he ended up going to work for a program that supports um, the Living on One film, which is called Mayan Families. This picture here, and I shared a picture last week, and everybody said they, they enjoyed the picture, so I have more to show you. This is um, in Antigua, Guatemala. So my job was to go down there and see what this whole Living on One Dollar was all about. Fernando was down there working for Mayan Families, so I said, great, somebody I just worked with this summer, I'm going to go down and visit them. So I got to go down to Guatemala, see Antigua, Guatemala. If you've never been to Antigua, it's about 45 minutes west of Guatemala City, amazing place. Uh, as you can see from these pictures that I took, just people out there trying to make a living, out there selling goods, trying to do good things. Um, another church, a lot of architecture out there in um, 
Antigua. You can see life is not easy for some of these people, and my job for myself was to capture it on film, so I could or on my camera, so I can show others. This was even just a parade that was happening in, Gua in Antigua. It was a protest for uh, our, a march for women's rights. So everybody was wearing orange. So my desire to do more service is I joined in the march and was part of it. This is a, a street performer while I was there. Also, the town, very religious, and they had a ceremony outside the church um, celebrating uh, the, uh, uh, we're close to Thanksgiving, so they had a little ceremony, and they were carrying a, a, a like a parade, um, so got to capture a little bit because my desire to do photography was enlightened again. Some of the pictures of an adobe hut, basically a house, and this is what it is. It's adobe clay and bamboo. A mural that's on the wall, and the artists down there, they have a style of, of murals out there that is from the bird's view, roughly translated, and this is the different beautiful murals that you see out there. So then I got to go out to um, visit um, Fernando, and he lives out in Panhechel, uh, which is on a lake, Lake Atalan. Um, so I got to go visit him. This is some views from the lake. We were in the market, and uh, we were shopping for Thanksgiving dinner, and because uh, I was an American, and there was lots of Americans down there. Fernando said, I'm not American, but I get the day off, so let's have a Thanksgiving dinner. And we got to go shopping, and again, I captured some, some pictures of the people down there, trying to give you just a sense of the people living in Guatemala and what they're all about. Again, this is a picture of some people, some street performers. There was actually a wedding going on that they got to take a selfie. <laughs> got to do that stuff. And again, the people on the streets that, uh, my Spanish is not great, but one thing I taught my, told myself I was going to be down there, I was going to have to communicate with people. And one of the people I met down there near uh, Lake Atalan was at a weaving cooperative in San Juan where the women, about 20, 25 women get together and they do weaving with natural um, yarn and they weave products to sell at a store and it's a cooperative. This is the picture I post at the end of the, the visit there. I, I had to get a picture of this woman and, and her daughter and I was like, I had maybe two or three seconds to really get the picture and I was trying to get a picture of them both looking at the camera but they didn't do it but this is what I got and I was pretty happy with it um, to say the least. Now I want to talk just briefly about Mayan families, and we'll have Fernando talk in a few minutes, but my experience was to go down there and see what Mayan families was about. And I got to go down there, see the, the area in which they have their offices. It's a program that goes out and does outreach out in the communities, and, and again, I have Fernando speak a little bit about it. When I was down there, I got to go with the program. We got to go up into the hills outside of Panachel, so we got to install a stove, and you can see in the person's house, because of the fact that a lot of, a lot of cooking is done in open areas, like inside houses, the smoke, it becomes an issue for the kids. I mean, you're, and, and everybody, they're inhaling the smoke from everything that's being cooked. So um, there's these stoves that come in that we build, and we install them. They're basically cinder block, 11 cinder block pieces, I think it is, um, and a ceramic base that you put together with some sand. And for 120 something dollars, I think it is, you're able to get one. Um, these families sign up to do that. And here's a family thanking us for installing the stove. This was on the way back out. It was kind of a Hail Mary shot. We were up on the coming down on the uh, on the, a truck that was bouncing on a very unsteady road, and I just kind of stuck the camera out the window to get a picture of, of uh, Lake Atalan, and this is what I got. So there's sometimes, like they say, you actually connect. These are some things that are made uh, by the people at um, Mayan families. Some of the, the community people learn how to make jewelry. They learn how to make cutting boards, and they sell them as fundraisers for the nonprofit. Um, this is, I think this is the jewelry box that's made out of wood, and Fernando can talk about it, wood that's really indigenous to the Guatemala area. Beautiful stuff they have there. As you can see, not something you find here in the United States but it's made at a carpentry shop that helps teach the locals carpentry skills and um, I think it's just a cool program that they have there so, to help the people make a better lives for themselves. As you can see, Rotary is a part of the local community too, so um, the goal is maybe someday we get to go back down there to do more work with Mayan families and so that's, that's where we're at with that. I just want to 
say thanks, and we want to bring Fernando in to talk a little bit about um, uh, my families. But I, I just found that going down there allowed me to do more of service type of activities, serving the community and being part of those people. And it was kind of inspired from the movie, inspired because Fernando is down there, a friend is working down there now, and I thought it was important that me, to, if I really want to be a, one to serve the community, to go to Guatemala and do that. So. All right, so Fernando, we'd love to have you kind of step in and, and describe uh, the organization, Mayan Families. Uh, so if you'd unmute that microphone there a bit, and let's get you on. Well, everybody, welcome, Fernando. Hi, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I met John uh, last year, and we did, John explained it very well, how we met and how we worked together over the summer, and then... Uh, and then, yeah, he, he really was uh, very interested in, in, in the film Living on One, and so I said, you know what, we're here. We actually have a partnership going on with the Living on One people. Um, we work in their communities, in the community where they live. Um, so you know what, it's a great opportunity for you to come down and see what, what is going on, the, the reality that many Guatemalans uh, um, live uh, every day. And uh, so John really did get to see a lot of that, and I'm glad that he got that opportunity. Uh, Mayan Families, it's, um, it's a nonprofit. We work mainly here in the Yatitlan region. That's yeah, in the rural Guatemala. A beautiful lake, uh, stunning scenery, but also a lot of people in, in extreme poverty and in a lot of need. Uh, so even though it is a tourist, very touristy place, there's a lot of, of need here, a lot of poverty. So uh, we have a lot of work to do here. Uh, we do a lot of education. Uh, that's our main program. We do student sponsorships where we are able to put kids through school starting from uh, preschool all the way to university if they stay within the program. Uh, we do a lot of family assistance, family aid, which includes food assistance, clean water, uh, stoves, which John was uh, just showing me a picture of, uh, medical assistance. Uh, we also have a shelter program where we try to do construction for people uh, who are living here and are in desperate need of housing. So we try to build them some uh, good housing for them. Uh, we have elderly care programs. Um, we really do have a lot of programs going on, but it's because of the big, big need that uh, the different communities have. Uh, we work around the lake. We have seven preschool centers uh, around the lake, and we've been growing out of those preschools. Uh, so from there, we've been able to expand, starting from with the kids, then expanding to helping their families um, with the medical assistance or with elderly care and different things like that. And also, um, Another part of the, the, the activities that we have, which is what I'm, I work on, is the income generating programs, uh, which are the educational programs meant to give people skills, uh, give people a trade so they can increase their income. Uh, so right now we have uh, sewing classes, carpentry classes, like John was just uh, showing you, um, computer classes. We're opening up a new welding school soon. Um, so all of these activities are meant to uh, provide people education, but provide them with a trade, because a lot of people here, they just simply uh, weren't able to go to school or school didn't work for them. So uh, we offer this possibility. People can join in, take our classes for a few months, and then they end up being very skilled carpenters, very skilled at weaving, <coughs> beading. You saw the pictures there, um, and John saw them firsthand, those boxes that were make, they're made from uh, exotic hardwoods you can only get in northern Guatemala. It's an eight-hour trip just to get the wood. It's and it turned into a beautiful thing. And then the students there also learn how to make furniture, things that are relevant to the community, right? So um, those are my programs, and also the microloans, microfinance programs. We have a very successful microloans program, uh, which serves, works under like a village banking methodology where women get together, and they form a group, they get a loan, and then they use it to um, kickstart their businesses or uh, just improve their businesses in general. That is a very nice program a lot of women have very successfully use their loans to provide for their entire families, open up a store, or set up a weaving business, and uh, it's worked really well. Um, and yeah, we're, we're a nonprofit. We work here in the Atitlan region. Uh, we're based in Panajachel, but as I mentioned, we're also in, seven diff in many different communities. And we're also registered in the US as a nonprofit. I believe it's a 501C, that you call it, um, C3. Um, so that allows us to work with people from the states. We do, all of our work is funded through donations, individual donors, uh, groups that come together and do donations, churches, 
uh, some rotary groups. Um, so everything we do, we don't rely on like big, big uh, grants or government funding. We're actually um, filling a void that's been left by the government here in terms of that there's not enough education uh, available, not enough assistance for families. So we're actually filling that void. We have very little government support here. And so yeah, being uh, registered in the United States allows us to work with donations from the United States and pretty much all over the world. And um, yeah, it's um, as I said, we we have a lot of programs. I just kind of went over them uh, very broadly, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Um, I hope I was able to cover all of what my and families does, which is a lot. As I said, there's still a lot of there's always a lot of need. Um, and in these these communities, so um, I don't know if you have any questions about this. Perfect. Well, Fernando, thank you, and thank you for joining us as well. Uh, I think one of the things you see both in last week's program uh, presented by Francois Tessier in, in Montreal uh, about the work he's doing in Sri Lanka and the kinds of things you see here is that the idea is to really look at the world and say not just what is happening, but what can I do. Right, and whether you're doing something large or small uh, in your community or elsewhere, you know the idea is to understand that you have something to give and, and to make a difference, right? Because you can. Uh, so with that, we've still got a few minutes, and I want to introduce the people who are who are on the hangout at the moment, uh, and we'll also get uh, some comments or questions from from uh, each of the three people from whom you haven't heard yet. Uh, and so just going across the screen. Uh, I'm Rushton Hurley. I'm the president of the club of Silicon Valley. Uh, Tracy Polzer is in Kamloops, British Columbia, a member of our club. Uh, Shag Shagrin is uh, also a part of the e club of Silicon Valley and a board member. Uh, John Lozano, our presenter today, uh, and and the traveler from whom we got the story. Uh, Fernando Morales, uh, who is in uh, Guatemala with uh, Mayan families, and Cecilia Babkert, who is uh, part of District 5170 for Rotary. Uh, she handles the Rotary Foundation programs uh, that, that we do here. And a uh, particular honor to have you joining us today. Uh, we, we, want, we want to have people from our district joining us whenever we can. So, so wildly cool of, of Cecilia to join in. So with that, what I'm going to have uh, uh, Tracy and Shags and Cecilia do is wave when you are ready to, like, come on, Shags, we'll have you go first. Go ahead and unmute yourself and toss out a question or a comment, and we'll go from there. I really enjoyed the presentation today, and John, I have a question about Children's International and Summer Village. I'd first heard about it in Ohio, and it was mostly when they were looking for host families. Is that still the case around here, that we can get involved by hosting students who are coming to the Bay Area for a, a summer program? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they, you would host people uh, either locally through your local chapter or if San Francisco was going out to a program out there in Ohio, um, you would be able to host families out there. There are chapters again, all over the United States, well, mostly in the Midwest, the United States and East, but um, uh, if there is a program over there locally, you can host a family um, or have host kids in your local community in Ohio. We host people here in San Francisco. It wouldn't necessarily be San Francisco people going to Ohio that you would host, but sometimes that does happen. Depends on the program. Thank you. And Tracy or Cecilia, do we have a, a comment or a question? Sure, I'll ask a, a question. Um, so thanks to both of you. That was really um, inspiring. Um, I had not heard of either of those organizations, but I certainly want to go Google and, and look up more information about both of them. Um, I'm just curious about how would someone become involved in volunteering or um, so for, for the Mayan families or how would uh, students, how would we get students involved with the summer camps? So I, I, I want to answer, I'll answer the, as far as kind of both of them. The CISV, we do have our, our closest chapters to San Francisco is actually in Vancouver, British Columbia. <laughs> so um, there's a local chapter there and so Really, I think if you just Google it, they should have a website um, for uh, the Vancouver chapter, and they would ask for volunteers in the community or people who want to be involved. Um, that's one way you can be involved, or students can sign up. Kind of the, the, the program selection happens around January, February time, and they get people uh, delegates prepared to go on summer programs for um, 
for the summertime. So really the cycle starts about January, goes through the whole summer. Um, so, but students can, live, depending on their age or what program they'd like to be at, on, be in, or where they're going, that's how they would find out about it. Um, I'll, I'll defer to, to Fernando. I was going to ask Fernando a question too about Mayan families. Is for those people who are watching, how can they be involved? If I don't speak Spanish fluently, but I got to definitely be a big part of the Mayan family program. Um, there's different things. I was just a heavy lifting guy, so I carried a lot of cinder blocks, which was a <laughs> lot of fun. So um, if you're a doctor or if you have another computer skill or whatever that is, I'm sure they can use you. But again, <clears throat> Fernando knows that I don't speak Spanish well, but I can definitely carry cinder blocks up the hill. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> when John was here, we took him for um, – uh, he installed, helped install a stove, uh, which are really great help to the families. That's for, that's one way, for example, people can get involved. Um, our ma the main way people are involved with Mind Families from the United States is through student sponsorships, where you can sponsor a student to go through um, wherever they are in, in their education. Um, your your sponsorship it covers all their educational uh, expenses. Um, you are sponsoring one specific person, so you get updates from that specific person. You get to see the report cards. Uh, it's a very transparent process, which is something we're very proud of. Um, that's our biggest program, which is a way to be involved um, from the U.S. We also take a lot of <clears throat> volunteers and groups. Um, for volunteers, people who are coming down here, um, just, uh, in general volunteers, we usually ask for a two-week commitment. Um, there's an application process for it. Um, but And we also have a lot of groups. Uh, for example, John was mentioning uh, medical clinics. Uh, at the moment, right now, we have a, a dental clinic from a college in the United States, um, and they're doing a dental clinic uh, here in, in Panajachel in our office. They were pulling out teeth all morning. Um, they've been doing uh, great work here. Um, so again, um, if, you were, if groups want to be involved with uh, the organization, there's always an, an application process if you have something specific that you want to do here, like a medical clinic or some other uh, educational program or assistance. Uh, a lot of groups, they'll get together, they'll do fundraising, and they will, for example, raise funds for 10 stoves, uh, 20 water filters, or something like that. And then they'll come here as a group to Guatemala, and they'll get to deliver, install the stoves, uh, deliver the water filters. If they have a sponsored student, they can meet that student. Um, so you get very, very involved directly with the communities. Um, again, through the student sponsorship, if you come down here, you'll go to their house, you'll meet them, you'll see how the family is living, um, it's a, it's a very, uh, you get very involved with the, the sponsored students. And um, yeah, through groups, uh, we've had, for example, some uh, Rotary groups that do fundraising and they um, get enough funds for installing several stoves or, or water filters or doing some construction work. And then they come here, spend uh, a week, for example, and they'll get to be very involved in the projects. Um, those are mainly the, those are the main ways um, that we they usually have people get involved with the organization. Very cool. Very cool. Cecilia, do you have uh, anything to finish us off with? Well, I have. I have a question for Fernando. Oh, first though, I want to say, John, sometimes Spanish language language skills in the Mayan areas is are, is, are not very helpful because yeah. the Mayans speak uh, something like twenty one separate languages, not even just dialects. So it can be a real challenge um, to communicate with the people themselves. You probably found that while you were down there. Um, but Fernando, um, I, my club, which is the Rotary Club of Cupertino, does a lot of work, um, project work, and we almost always have one or more projects going in Guatemala. Um, we have a couple of them going right now and are about to begin a third. And I'm just curious, does your organization coordinate with any of the other organizations that are doing work um, in your area? And I'm thinking specifically of one called Todos por el Lago, um, which is in San Lucas, Toliman. Mm -hmm. And their work is less about education and more about things that will improve the environment, reforestation, um, eco-latrines, uh, wash stations that drain into a uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment so that when the water goes back into the lake it's clean, um, and fuel efficient stoves and things like that. And so I'm just curious if you're familiar with them or, or are coordinating any of your efforts with theirs. Uh, yes, hi. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we, I have heard of them, but uh, I don't think we do many direct work with them. Um, 
we uh, we mostly do our our own projects here on this part of the of the lake. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest with you, I, I don't I don't think there's anything going on with them. I wouldn't have the right answer for you. There. Sure. And um, there is there's no right answer or wrong answer actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but are you doing work in Sununa? Uh, no, not not in Sununa. We are mainly here on this side of the lake, Uspanachel, San Antonio. Um, like on the lake, those communities, we do a lot of work like out in the mountains, so like kind of far away from the lake. Uh, yeah, but Sununa is there. right at the lake shore, um, yeah. very very close to Panajacho. Yeah, uh, we're not there yet. We do done work in San Jorge, which is also close there, mm -hmm. um, and some of the other side of the lake as well. Usually, we're more located in this this part. Um, but yeah, those for now I've heard of them. They yeah, they do more environmental things. We don't do a lot of of, of that yet, but you can't um, do things to, to all people. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of projects going on. But, um, no, I haven't, I haven't, I'm not sure we do uh, work with them. And also you're right about the Spanish. Uh, you speak, there are people here speak Cachiquel mostly, and I've had meetings where it's all in uh, Mayan language, which I don't understand, and I need translators here as well. So. <laughs> right. Anyway, it's great meeting you. Yeah, great meeting you too. All right. Well, everybody, thank you very much for taking part. Um, so the, the goal for us is to is to be able to uh, kind of show examples of you know people making uh, you know making a decision to go out and make a difference somewhere and and it's wonderful to have uh, a, a participant you know kind of on the you know there in in Guatemala Fernando thanks again uh, to to our team uh, John for the presentation and Shags and Tracy for taking part as well uh, and especially to our our, our district guest. All right, Cecilia, thank you for, for taking part also. All of you who are visiting us, we, we encourage you to, uh, to fill out the, uh, the survey that is, that is under, um, under this, you know, like on the web page, because that survey lets us know you attended. So you have to do that if, if we're going to register your attendance. And if you're a guest, that will generate an email that you can use to use as a makeup. Uh, with, with the ease of being able to get to an online meeting, one need never lose their 100% attendance. That's our perspective on this. Um, we also want you to add comments at the bottom as well. So there is an area, uh, the discus system, uh, for, for you to, you might need to kind of join it once, but uh, it allows you to take part in conversations that happen down there, and we'd love to see your comments. We'd like to add comments from the previous week to the uh, current week's meeting. So for everybody, uh, thank you very much for taking part. I uh, hope you've enjoyed our meeting this week. We hope that you will come back and join us just as often as you're able. You're always welcome to come by and see what we've got going, the information, and hopefully a little inspiration for you as well. So with that, we'll, we'll, all, we'll all wave goodbye and wish you a great week.